Welcome to Price This House. I'm Dave O'Neill with Century 21 Northeast in North Reading, Mass. And I'm Kimberly O'Neill Mara, also at Century 21 Northeast. Thank you for joining our mid-year review. We are going to discuss the North Reading, Reading, Linfield, and Andover markets for January through June of 2018 and compare it to the results from 2017. We'll get right to the details with just the facts. Dave, take it away. Great. Uh, Price This House is proud to report that in North Reading, single family homes for the first half of 18 are 76 units that have sold versus 85 last year. Virtually the same, very, very close. Average list price for the same period is 568000 this year versus 592000 last year. That's a 4% differential. Average sale price, 569000 versus 589000, a 3% differential. And price per square foot, this year is $273 per square foot versus last year was $276 per square foot. Again, very negligible difference. Uh, days on the market, this year is 30 versus 28 a year ago. So it's very, very uh, common uh, that the numbers don't move all that much. For condos um, in North Reading, 28 units sold this year versus 26 last year, an 8% plus. Uh, average list price this year is $247,000 versus $314,000 last year. That's a 21% differential. Average sale price $247,000 this year versus $317,000 last year. That's a 22% decrease. And price per square foot this year was $248 versus $260,000 last year, a 5% differential. Days on market this year is only $16,000 versus $28,000 last year. That's a 43% increase, uh, meaning it takes that much less time for something to sell that's a condo. Multifamilies this year, we had two, last year one. Our average list price this year, 542,000 versus 518,000. That's a 5% differential. Um, average sale price, 505 versus 540 last year. That's a 6% differential. Price per square foot for multifamilies in North Reading, $165 versus last year, $200 per square foot. Days on market this year, six versus 12 last year. That's half the time. Uh, land this year, only two units sold versus two last year. Average list price this year was 165 versus last year, 197. Average sale price, 151 this year versus 189 last year. And days on market, 87 this year versus 248 last year. So that shows you that the market is faster and is happening at, at a steady pace. Kim? Thanks, Dave. And now to discuss the Reading market. For single family home sales for the first half of 18 versus 17, we only hit 88 homes versus 108 last year, which is a 19% decrease. I think the talk of the town really is the lack of inventory, and that's a great example of um, it really being tight. Um, the list price was 620 versus 608 a year ago, which is a 2% increase, and the sale price was 634 versus 628, which was 1% increase. So fairly steady, um, even though we had a lot less inventory. The price per square foot did go up to 319 in 2018 from uh, 304 a year ago, and the days till offers were made or to, uh, 22 versus 18. So again, it sounds like it's a 22% difference, but it's um, you know not that many extra days. For the, go ahead. No, I was just going to add, if you look at the average list price of 620 versus the average sale price of 634, that addresses the overbidding. That addresses people offering a lot more than asking price in this market, and that is happening in all the towns in the area. Absolutely, absolutely. I think we see that in all, yeah, right down the board. Um, for condos in Reading, we had 45 this year versus 42 a year ago. Um, the average list price was 420 versus 432. Uh, the average sale price was 419 versus 434. So those both stayed fairly steady. And the price per square foot um, increased to 320 in 2018 versus 312 in 2017. And the days on market was 23 this year versus 35. So the days on market um, definitely decreased by 34%, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. um, you know a sign that people are scooping things up when they become available. Um, for multifamilies in Reading, we had seven this year versus only four a year ago. Again, with so, such small numbers, that's you know a 
75% increase, but you know, you're only dealing with a couple of uh, actual units there. The average list price was 577, 771 versus 603, 700 a year ago, and it sold for, and the average sales price was 574, 404 versus 605, 250. Um, the price per square foot actually increased quite a bit, up to 250 from 224. That's a 12% increase year over year. And once again, the days on market decreased from um, 40 a year ago to 31 this year. That's a 23% decrease in, number, in amount of time on market. No land sold in Reading this year or last year. Reading is pretty saturated. There's just not much land left. So I'll turn it back to Dave. Okay, now we'll look at Linfield. First half of 2018, there were 65 units sold versus 17, there were 68 units sold, almost the same. Average list price this year, 750, versus 722 last year, that's a 4% increase. Average sale price of 757, versus 705 last year, that's a 7% increase. Again, look at your average list price of 750, your average sale price of 757. That talks about the overbidding. Uh, price per square foot, 266 this year, versus 268 last year. Days on market, um, 52 versus 41 uh, last year. In condos, we had 11 units sold this year versus 10 last year. Uh, average list price was 496 versus 590 last year. Average sale price, 477 versus 582 last year. That's an 18% drop. But again, that has to go with um, the different new construction going on that um, Yeah, two years ago, prices. marketplace was the yeah. higher priced condos mm -hmm. were being sold, so that throws right. it off a little. And um, price per square foot, 285 versus 292. And days on market, 103 versus 70. Um, multifamilies, not existent. Land, uh, none this year. There were a couple last year. But again, like you said in Reading, there just is very, very little land out there. And just one thing to point out about your Linfield days on market for condo sales, it's higher than, significantly higher than single families because sometimes the day till offers or the days on market is higher with new construction because, you know, you're still, you're dealing with, you know, not a finished product. You're waiting for something to be built. Exactly. Right. Um, to finish out the, um, just the facts, we'll hit Andover for 2018. We had 154 a single family home sell versus 175 a year ago. That's a 12% decrease. Um, the s average list price went way up though. It went up to 802, 814 as a list price versus 698, 466 a year ago. So that's a 15% increase over $100,000 mm -hmm. increase on your average list price. Um, and it also increased over 100,000 for sale. The average sale price was 793 versus 693 um, a year ago. Again, a 14% increase. So um, that's what happened when there's mm -hmm. limited inventory, the you know prices, prices get shot up. It's basic supply and demand. Um, price per square foot went up to 262 from 251 a year ago, and the days on market um, decreased to 37 from 42 a year ago. For condo sales, we had 78 this year versus 68 a year ago. That's a 15% increase. Um, the price went um, down actually for, uh, to 373, 480 versus 437, 176 a year ago. And the average sale price um, was, uh, you know, again, um, over the average list price of 376, 101 versus 429, 094 a year ago. Again, with different condo um, associations and projects and new construction, the, um, the average pricing you know will vary quite a bit um, the price per square foot went up a lot to 281 from 252 a year ago which is a 12 percent increase and the days on market stayed pretty flat 45 versus 46. Um, not a lot of multifamilies in Andover, but we did have three sell this year. Um, the average list price was about 485000 versus 480000 a year ago, so fairly flat. Um, the average sale price was 488 versus uh, 480 a year ago, so again, fairly flat. We're talking three versus one. Um, the price per square foot was 163 versus 201 a year ago, and the days on market was 30 this year versus last year, the one that came on the market sold that, that first day. Um, there was no land that sold in Andover, same story. Um, this year, there were two um, parcels that sold last year, but none, none in the current uh, mm. first half of the year. Um, so that wraps up just the facts. All the stats say tight market, just no inventory. Buyers want to buy something, they're overbidding in all the communities. Mm -hmm. The sellers mm -hmm. are very happy with the right. outcomes, but it's challenging for buyers exactly. to come in and, and mm -hmm. really, you know, some of them are presenting mm -hmm. offers on lots of different properties, and it's... Interesting to the see how high point, they'll go. The one point I think our viewers would like to know is that we're not having problems with appraisals. 
if a house comes on the market at 500,000 and ends up selling for 525, okay, typically you'd say, well, you should have priced it higher. That isn't the case. It's supply and demand. So if you put it on at 500, you're going to get two, three, four offers and the people are going to overbid. Mm -hmm. If you came on the market at 525, you probably would sit there and the buyers wouldn't be excited and you wouldn't have multiple offers and you'd end up getting a lower offer. Mm -hmm. So the appraisals for the banks, they're going along with the tight market, but the buyers, if it's priced too high, they just reject it and they don't buy it. Mm -hmm. well, this exact thing happened here in mm -hmm. North Reading on Plymouth uh, Street just uh, last month. We had it priced in the mid fours. It sold for five at the first open house. Mm -hmm. If we'd priced it in the fives, we wouldn't have gotten five. Yeah. So it was one of those things where, you know, and it did appraise fine um, because the market supported mm -hmm. it. But um, that's a perfect example of something that just happened in the last couple yeah. weeks right here in town. You need to position them at the right place. Absolutely. Really do. Absolutely. Um, so moving on to Spotlight, we're going to talk about um, one home from each of the communities. We're kind of hovering at that million dollar um, price point. So um, here we go on to the Spotlight. Okay, great. We're going to talk about 11 Jill Circle in North Reading. That's in the Country Edge subdivision. It's about 5,000 square feet, and that included the lower level in-law. Had a beautiful master suite up over the garage, which had a peekaboo fireplace from both the bathroom and the living room and the bedroom. Had a two-story family room with a turret. Very, very nice. From the second floor balcony, you overlooked the family room. And then all the windows in the turret overlooked the gorgeous yard. Had three-acre lot with a gorgeous gunite pool, just dressed to the nines. The kitchen was showplace. The hardwood floors were showplace. The entire house was just pristine. Again, it listed for nine eighty five and sold for nine ninety six at the first open house. It's wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. And uh, you listed it and sold it, so congratulations. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> it's always nice to have a double header. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> congratulations. Yeah. Um, on to one eighty eight Van Norden Road in Reading. That's um, the road right off of Franklin Street. That listed for nine forty nine and sold in the first day for one oh four two one point oh four two million. Um, it was built in two thousand and eight. It was a 12-room, four-bedroom, three full and one-half bath, including a master bath. It had a beautiful fireplace, about 3,800 square feet, including a finished basement. Um, it was really beautiful. Um, it, they, you know, they it described it as majestically set on a 1.6-acre lot. It was wooded views, open space from almost every window. Um, it was just a lovely, lovely home, um, and it sold, as I said, on the first day it hit the market um, for well over asking price. So um, it doesn't matter if you're at the 300,000 level, at the million dollar level, at the $10 million level, things are just kind of moving on every exactly. price point. Exactly. So now we'll look at Linfield. Three Cranberry Lane came on the market at 1.1 and sold for 1.1. It's a 4,100 square foot colonial on an acre of land, just absolutely exquisite. It uh, was on a cul-de-sac street. It's a Wills built home, which says quality throughout. It had a heated gunite pool with a waterfall, hot tub. Those are the amenities people look for at that million dollar mark. Um, the grounds were just impeccable. Had a huge four season room with a vaulted ceiling, heated floors, oversized kitchen, uh, tons of uh, entertainment space, just a real pristine home. Again, 1.1, it was only on the market for six days and sold for 1.1. And even when we say six days, that probably includes a couple of days negotiating or a couple of days to get the signatures and so forth mm -hmm. before it got reported to MLS. Even an so inspection right or things. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. All that stuff adds up. Um, to finish out the spotlight, we're going to look at three Possum Hollow Road in Andover. Um, I actually was fortunate to sell this house myself before it actually hit the market. My buyers were out, saw the coming soon sign go up. They mm -hmm. gave me a call. Dave helped us out, out got all everyone in there made an offer, had it accepted before it even hit the market. So we're even seeing that sometimes. So most of the agents in the area, we all have so many buyers, we have lists of people that are looking to buy at different price points in different communities. And so we're able to kind of play matchmaker uh, behind the scenes a little bit before it even comes on the market. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those cases where we had a home, we had the buyer, and we put it together. Mm -hmm. um, people think it's easy to do, but it, was, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of work and effort to keep those lists and, and keep everybody mm -hmm. happy and in the right position. But anyhow, for this particular home, it was listed for 1.279 and it sold for 1.265. It was a gorgeous nine-room, four-bedroom, 
three and a half bath home with a master bath, two fireplaces. It was only two years old, um, and so sometimes you know um, they call it better than new construction because some of the things like the um, you know the blinds and things like that had been put up already as opposed to walking into total new construction. Um, it was 4,100 square feet, and it was on 1.27 acres um, in uh, West Andover. So it was absolutely a, a gorgeous, gorgeous home. That house had a beautiful crystal chandelier in the master bedroom. Probably one of the most elegant master suites you'll see. The that fireplace, and yeah, yeah, it was very, yeah. very nice. Very, very, very nice. nice. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have a special visitor. Uh, after the break, we're going to come back with Dave Bancroft, sweeping man, chimney sweep. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the importance of having your chimney inspected and swept. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We've been joined by Dave Bancroft, who's the owner of Sweeping Man Chimney Sweeps right here in North Reading. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I think it's a real important uh, aspect of somebody owning a home to know about having their chimney swept or inspected and so forth. So you just want to talk a little bit about the process and what you actually do when you inspect a chimney? Absolutely. When we sweep a chimney, talking about a fireplace, we bring our floor protection in, our drop cloths, and set that up so no dust gets anywhere. We bring in all our tools and equipment. We have a very powerful vacuum that eliminates the possibility of dust escaping into the customer's home. And then we, re we take all the logs off the grate. We take the grate out of the fireplace, brush that off. We brush down the inside of the fireplace walls, the firebox. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we open up the damper which is the, up, the up, up above the fireplace that you open and close when you have a fire. We remove that and all the moving parts, if it's removable, they usually are. And we wire brush all the metal parts, the moving parts. And then we run our brush right up to the top of the chimney until it pokes out the top. We usually sweep them from below, inside really? the fireplace. Oh. Mean, meanwhile, the vacuum's going to contain all the dust. Mm -hmm. And then we... After we get done brushing the flue, we spin, usually rotary clean the smoke chamber, which is the area just above the fireplace. I keep looking at this behind us. Uh, and then we, we will um, take all the debris off the smoke shelf, which is the flat area behind the damper. Okay. That's where all, if there's no chimney cap, that's where all the leaves fall. And that's where we find the animal skeleton okay. sometimes. Oh. Um, that's where all the soot accumulates. So you have a brush that goes all the way to the top. What if there's yes. a chimney cap? Does it go up and actually touch the chimney cap? So yes, you get yeah, okay. exactly. And then we know we're at the top. Okay. Yeah. Okay. How long does the process take? Usually it takes 45 minutes to an hour and a half. But after the, the most important thing that we do after we run the brush up there is we video scan the inside of the chimney. We actually run a video camera up inside the flue look around, check for any gaps or cracks or missing mortar joints between the clay flue tiles and make sure all the, the smoke and stuff is contained within the chimney. And that would be the safety portion of what you do? Right. It's okay. the inspection. That's the okay. big thing. Okay. Yeah, you know, when we sell a home and people have a general home inspection, the inspectors, they might like peek their light up the chimney, but they really don't do a full inspection. And we always tell our buyers mm -hmm. that you should have you know, a separate inspection done. Is right. that something that should be done before they light their first fire? Oh, positively. And then mm -hmm. how often should they have it? Yeah, the, the big thing is if somebody's buy, looking to buy a house and it has fireplaces and chimneys for the heating system, they should definitely get them inspected by somebody like me, a certified chimney sweep, mm -hmm. prior to buying the house. Mm -hmm. And then there's no surprises after the fact. Okay. So they should have it inspected before they buy it. And then how often should they have it inspected? Does it depend on how often you light fires? Or is it like every year regardless? Or what's your kind of general suggested NFPA, time? National Fire Protection Association, recommends annual inspections. However, if they don't use it, you know, a fireplace, it wouldn't need to be inspected mm -hmm. but every few years. Mm -hmm. But that initial inspection when they first buy the house or before they buy the house, even better, get us out there, do a full thorough inspection, including a video camera like I talked about, and then they'll have no surprises going further down the road. And is your standard service the inspection plus the cleaning together? 
Yes. The sweeping together. Okay. When it comes to a real estate transaction, NFPA recommends what's called a level two inspection mm -hmm. of all flues in the chimney. And that consists of a full inspection with a video camera. Mm -hmm. Okay. What kind of background or what kind of training do you have to be able to do this? Well, I started out in the masonry trade right out of high school. And then I got tied up. I got involved in the chimney industry in 1989. Okay. I actually saw an ad in a magazine to be my own boss and I sent away for a big kit which came with a big vacuum, standard brushes, rods, and an instruction manual on how to do all of it as well as a marketing manual so I could market the sales. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I dabbled with that and it was really hard because in the spring and summer it was hard to you know, have a customer base in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I tried a whole bunch of other things, got involved in the street sweeping business, mm -hmm. and then eventually, to make a long story short, I, I got serious with this in 2004 when I incorporated Sweep and Man, Inc. Mm -hmm. So 13 years now we've been going strong here in North Reading. So you have a masonry background as well. So if you identify an issue while you're doing the inspection, say there's loose brick or it needs to be whatever happens to ha needs to happen, do you then also do the repairs or does that get outsourced to a different mason or how does that part of it work? No, we do all the restoration repair work and the masonry work in-house. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All my guys are cross-trained in masonry. Okay. Well, that's you talked time. about a couple of organizations and what they suggest. You've had specialized training with those organizations? Or? Yes. Um, okay. I'm actually a master chimney sweep with CSIA, Chimney Safety Institute of America. Mm -hmm. They have a really good website for homeowners to go on, csia.org. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of useful information about your chimney, fireplace, heating system, dryer vent. That's another thing that we mm -hmm. probably should touch on is the importance to have your dryer vent serviced mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And you offer that service as well? We do. Wonderful. We do. Yeah. And I see, we, we, we both sell real estate like kind of all over the place, and I can't tell you how many times I see your, your um, vans and whatnot all over town, and we say, oh, North Reading, and we could be anywhere. What is your actual service area? How far do you go? What's your kind of sweet spot? Our range is southern New Hampshire to northern Londonderry probably, out to Nashua, west as far as like Lancaster, Pepperell, wow. Shirley, yeah, really go far. and we go all the way to all Cape Ann and the North Shore. Mm -hmm. We go into Boston, but not too much, and we don't really go south of Boston. Okay. So that's our range. That's Basically, great... this, this hub right here north of Boston. Mm -hmm. yep. good, good, good. How often do you see a chimney fire? Or how often? We, I imagine you'd be the first person called in after they had a fire yeah. to clean out. Yep. How often do you see that? Quite often. We probably mm -hmm. see, you know, six or eight every season. Wow. And, of course, they happen in the fall when people are first starting them. Mm -hmm. You know, without having them inspected, you might not know what you're faced with in there, and there could be underlying problems. So You mentioned leaves and so forth coming down the chimney. Is that what would catch on fire? So as the, the wood burns and the, the things are going up, yep. they, that's what's going to catch on fire? No, there's a couple of, I would say, latent defects in a chimney in a fireplace chimney is probably the number one cause and it's from not having it inspected and it and it's from when it was built originally the the contractor might not have no, been f totally familiar with all the codes and a big problem is the area between the lintel and the damper frame so the lintel is the top angle iron that supports the veneer brick on the face of the fireplace opening that area behind that where the damper frame is, sometimes there's a gap in there and sometimes a gap opens up over time, but that's a very vulnerable area because it's right over the fire and if you have flames and heat going right up in there, the, the back side of the wood trim and the mantle is like right there. So a lot of times when you hear about a chimney fire, it's really not caused from the it's caused from the structure. It's mm -hmm. a structural wow. fire. So that goes back to having the inspection before you buy it. Absolutely. Okay. you got to check for proper clearance mm -hmm. to combustible and just making sure that everything was done right when they built it. That's just huge. Okay. Yeah. We had an owl get into our house through the chimney once. So um, I don't know about you, but I'll be calling you tomorrow to set up an inspection. <laughs>
I, I, I've been she in lives my house. in the antique. <laughs> yeah, I live in an antique, and I've been there for more than 10 years, and I'm embarrassed to say that we've never had you out, but um, I'll, that'll be changing tomorrow. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. <laughs> Yeah. Anything else that you can tell our viewers that are, you know, think, I know it's the middle of the, middle of the summer, no one's really thinking about their fireplaces and yeah. having them serviced. Yeah. Is this a good yeah. time to do it? Is there a best time or anything now's, else you can? Yeah, now's a really good time. Um, typically, July 4th comes and goes, and after July 4th, people start realizing that fall and winter is going to come again. Mm -hmm. It's inevitable. It's going to get cold. They're going to have to get have heat. And um, so now is a really good time because if you wait until September or October, we're going to just be slammed with work and you'll have to wait a while. You talk about masonry fireplaces, but what about like gas fireplaces or wood stoves? Do you inspect them as well? Oh, yeah. Do? Um, we don't work on gas fireplaces as far as repairing them, but we work a lot with the local hearth stores that sell gas inserts. Mm -hmm. And what happens is the, uh, one of their clients will buy a gas insert and then they'll give them one of our business cards because the requirement is before you install a gas fireplace into an existing masonry fireplace, mm -hmm. it needs to be swept and level two inspected, which includes a video scan. So that's where we come in. We go out and we do a sweep and thorough inspection. And then sometimes what we'll do is we'll get the liner from the hearth store and install the venting. So the venting, it's swept and inspect it and the venting will be all in place ready for their plumber and gas installer to come in. They won't even have to go on the roof now because the venting's already in place and they just take it from there and install their thing. And So the venting is like sheet metal within the chimney chamber? The venting for a gas fireplace typically is two three inch aluminum liners. One of them is for the vent mm -hmm. and one of them is for intake air. So it's a direct vent unit. Mm -hmm. okay. The vent goes out, the air comes in, and everything is good. Now, what about chimney caps? Is that something that you install? And you know, you see some like maybe fifty percent have them, fifty percent don't. Like, what yeah. are the reasons that you should have them? And is it something that you do? R yes, we do a lot of chimney caps, mm -hmm. and the the hot item right now is an outside mount multi flu chimney cap that covers the entire top of the chimney. So it's got a it's got an outer flange that encapsulates the top perimeter of the chimney and keeps all the weather off it. Then it's got a lid that goes over the top with screen sides. Mm -hmm. And then the lid comes off on and off with wing nuts so we can get in there if it ever needs any service. Um, but the base is hard mounted to the top of the chimney mm -hmm. and it gives you full protection. They're available in both stainless steel and copper and they come in eight different powder coated color choices. Oh. Yeah. Are there any other like upkeep or maintenance things that you should be doing to a chimney? Like, do you have to like keep resealing it? So, I mean, as the mortar deteriorates and things like that, like, what is el what else should people be keeping in mind? Well, we do a lot of waterproofing. So, in the springtime, we get a lot of calls for leaking chimneys because mm -hmm. we fix leaky chimneys. Okay. And we so a lot of times there's five reasons why water can get into a chimney. The number one thing is because it's got big holes at the top where the, the flues come out. Mm -hmm. You know, some chimneys have one flue. If you have like your heating system and a couple of fireplaces, then that chimney might have three flues. Okay. And they might be great big flues, like a fo one foot square opening. So it's like big holes in your chimney. Mm -hmm. So of course, the big thing is to put a cap over it. It's like an umbrella for your chimney. It keeps all the rain out. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's the number one thing is a cap. Then the crown is the cement on top of the chimney. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that'll get cracked because it expands and contracts and the flue goes up and down and cracks that crown, the cement mm -hmm. crown. So we can put a cap on, we seal the crown or we can pour a new crown sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then, so now you have an umbrella and if you go with an outside mount cap, it's got a drip edge on the edge. So it sheds the water mm -hmm. completely off the top. But then the mortar joints are susceptible to water penetration and the brick are porous, so they're susceptible also. So it might have a hairline crack that needs to be ground out and then pointed with some new mortar. And then after we do pointing work, we would um, spray it with water repellent. Mm -hmm. And then the, num the other thing is the flashing at the roof line. A lot of times the, flash the flashing isn't done properly or 
in an older house, it might have had a couple of different roofs put on. And th what they do is they take an, a hatchet and they go around the chimney and they hack all the flashing off. And then they might put new flashing on, or they might not. They might just take some roofing tar and put it on there. And then all of a sudden you have a leak because it dries out and, you know, right. starts to crack in a couple of years down the road. And we, we do flashing all the time, replacement of flashing. So we spray water repellent. We do pointing. We do the crown coat up at the top or pour a new crown, mm -hmm. or we do a cap. So those are the five reasons why you get water in a chimney. Wow. Very common stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Things you never think of. Oh, yeah. no, right, yeah. yeah. Never I, I, I never imagined that the like the chimney sweep and the masonry, I mean, it obviously makes sense now that I'm hearing it, but it never right. dawned on me that it was mm. the same person that would do it. Yeah, so, yeah. Hmm. And the big thing is, too, the heating systems that vent into people's chimneys. So they have a fireplace like this, and little do they know, they have an oil burner down in the basement that also vents into the same chimney. Mm -hmm. And then the flue runs up beside the back of the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Look, so if you had an x-ray vision like Superman, you could see in there, and you could see that flue running up beside the fireplace. Well, it's a very vulnerable spot because the fireplace has your damper on top, and if the flue goes up right in the back of that, and it's not all sealed, if there's no petition wall and it's not properly cemented, mm -hmm. then you could potentially have byproducts of combustion from the oil or gas heating system coming, coming right past your living room fireplace. Oh, wow. And that can be very dangerous. So that's another thing that they should really get inspected, especially coming into the fall and winter season here. Mm -hmm. Very important to get the heating system flu and the chimney inspected. Is that how you came up with Sweeping Man with the Superman type of power. Yeah, you caught that, TV. huh? The Superman thing. Yeah, <laughs> Superman's my hero. All yeah. Right, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been wow. so informative. Like yeah. I said, you'll be hearing from me soon. Yeah. And, so uh, informative. Yeah. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule my to help pleasure. educate our viewers. My we really pleasure. It. My and pleasure. you're located Thanks right here in North Reading. Yep, right on Main Street. We have a new facility right on Main Street. Bright red sign out front. Great. So far, oh, it's a green briar, right? Yes. Right yep. on Main Street up at the Green Bay. Right. Yep. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for coming. We really we appreciate it. My pleasure. I think that wraps things up. Yeah, we'll be right back. Welcome back. That was some great information, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, you know, the heat of the summer, so it's hard to think about uh, fireplaces exactly. and needing to light a fire right now, but this is exactly. the time to do it, get yeah. it ready for uh, the brisk fall that will be here, mm -hmm. unfortunately, before you know it. So, oh, um, so thanks mm -hmm. to Dave for all that wonderful information. Um, right now, we're going to talk about Beantown and Beyond. This is the portion of the show where we highlight a property that's in the Boston or general vicinity. Um, we're going to highlight 75 Summer Street in Watertown Square. It's on the market for 949 this is this condo is gorgeous it's over 4,000 square feet on four floors um, it has four bedrooms and five bathrooms um, and two park two cars for parking as well as a nice yard it is literally a block from everything there's a library and parks and museums and um, children's activities buses and it's really a great great location um, it's a little over 4,000 square feet Gorgeous, gorgeous new construction in 2015, and um, just had one owner that has been there for about two and a half years, and um, getting a ton of activity on it, lots of showings, and uh, I think this one's you know going to move very, very quickly. So if anybody has anybody interested in the Watertown area or the Greater Boston area, please let us know. Um, again, that's 75 Summer Street in Watertown Square, listed for 949. And if any of you have any questions about this property, any property that we discussed, or anything real estate related in general, please feel free to email us at price.thishouse at century21.com. And from that, we'll turn over to something, something to, to think, think about. about. Well, something that's very popular in North Reading is the new construction going on over at Martin's Landing. Um, they right now are offering pre-construction pricing and it's a 55 plus community. It has a modern, secure, elevated building, so people don't have to do stairs to be able to take that up. The average one bedroom unit is about 1,470 square feet. It comes with gas heat, individual central air, and um, very, very nice finishes, very, very nice uh, amenities throughout. 
Uh, the pricing in all the different units, it has to go with location in the building and all of that, but um, range from 338000 for uh, a one-bedroom to 482000 for a one-bedroom. So again, it's size, location, and amenities that are in the units. But you can get in there at 338000 which is a pretty good price. And um, once the complex is finished, it's going to be nine buildings, 50 units in each building. So that's 450 units. It's going to take a couple of years to build it out. So if you want to be one of the first people in and don't mind living in the construction and so forth, you pick up some instant equity. And that's the benefit of pre-construction um, buying. So if you have any interest, give Kim and myself a call, and we'll be glad to get, share all the information with you. Yeah, and because they are 55 and over, it's actually going to give North Reading and the surrounding communities a little bit of housing relief because mm -hmm. as people are aging into that, a lot of baby boomers are, mm -hmm. uh, actually the youngest of the baby boomers are already turning 55. They're going to be looking for some of that type of housing, which is going to open up some of the single family mm -hmm. living in the communities as well. So we're certainly happy to help you figure out your next steps and, and what the best mm -hmm. real estate moves are for you. So again, feel free to reach out to Dave or to me directly, or you can email us together at price this house at century21.com. That concludes our mid-year review for 2018. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really a pleasure. If you have any questions regarding the real estate market, we've been doing it forever. Uh, give us a call or email us and we'll be glad to treat you individually and help plan the transaction for you and what meets your needs. Thank you. Thank you.